This is Twit. And now we're back from the break, and we are joined by a familiar face. It's Jason Howell. Hello, Jason. Hey, how's it going? Just, you know, wearing <laughs> very dated uh, face computer architecture on my on my head right now. Don't don't worry about this thing. It's Google Glass. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's it could be coming back into style. I think if I saw one of those today and I never heard about Google Glass, I would feel a little bit more like, oh, that's probably just, you know, some 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 headset that people wear these days. I, I It doesn't seem as out of place as maybe it once did. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I kind of... Um, one of the many things that I came away from this whole Android XR experience, which we're going to talk about with, which is how far we've come from Google Glass, you know, more than a decade ago, when it was really, I think history has shown this is, this was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And now it's paved the way for things that are a lot more normalized now and still very cool. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the part where you get a moment to brag because <laughs> um, you got to be a part of a pretty exclusive experience. Can you tell us about what that is? Yeah, well, uh, Google unveiled just this morning uh, Android XR, which is its new platform built around Android and with Gemini AI at the core. They said it's their first OS uh, built with Gemini kind of from the ground level. Um, and they're launching that to essentially do, or hopefully, but from their perspective, do for extended reality devices like VR and wearable glasses and that sort of stuff, what they did for smartphones with Android, you know, more than a decade and a half ago. And Google reached out to me last week and said, hey, we'd love uh, to invite you down to Mountain View to try out our, our prototypes. You can't shoot any video or take any pictures of your experience, but you can hang out with the execs that made this stuff and check it out. And I spent like an hour and 15 minutes uh, going through all of their hardware and, and I felt very special, Micah. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah. So uh, with Android XR, I think it represents Google's renewed commitment to XR after, you know, we've got Google Glass, we've got Daydream VR. Yeah. Um, how does this approach differ from those earlier efforts? I think without getting too much into the Gemini AI just yet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that is really a, a big key part of it is this moment that we're in in AI and this being a really wonderful kind of conduit to kind of bring that into the experience. But, you know, I think a lot of people are going to have the knee jerk reaction of, oh, great, Google's launching this next thing. How, you know, how start the, how the it's timer gone? until yeah. it's it's gone. But I, I kind of feel like this is a little different. Like Daydream, yes, was a VR platform that Google, you know, really worked on for maybe three years. It was also very early into kind of like this VR resurgence when we saw Oculus kind of excel and uh, it become, you know, the meta quest and everything. The, the landscape has kind of proven itself a little bit more at this point. And I think what Google has done here is they've recognized that there is yet another kind of field of technology that they can potentially get a lot of support, a lot of manufacturers who are thinking about creating these different headsets. And we're not just talking VR, we're talking you know wearable glasses and other form factors that we haven't even really seen yet. Um, why not give them an OS that is tailor-made for that specific thing? We've already got Android. And I think really they're very motivated around this right now because more and more it seems like the benefits of artificial intelligence and the benefits and experience of virtual reality, in my mind, it's kind of like a chocolate and peanut butter butter mm. thing. You know, it's kind of like they, yes. they complement each other so well. So it makes sense that Google would want to be, you know, have its Gemini at the core of it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, just this morning, um, I was <laughs> uh, actually, no, we don't have a lot of time, so I will not tell the story, but let's just say I used a little AI um, XR moment uh, this morning and I thought, wow, you know, this is one of those things. Yeah. I took a photo of something and I asked AI for some help with this thing and it worked really well. But um, let's oh, talk about yeah. now, we can talk about the integration of Gemini AI into Android XR. That's central to the functionality. So Tell people what are the unique features that Gemini brings to the platform when it comes to interaction and that uh, that term that Apple definitely likes, spatial computing. <laughs> spatial face computer. Um, I, think, I think what's different here is that Google has done a lot of work on the mobile phone with Gemini on 
creating this experience where if I have a phone and I'm running Gemini, I can point it at a sign, you know, that's in a, in a foreign language. And I can say, hey, translate that for me. And it'll do it on my phone. Now we're kind of, and we can have that conversation in order to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're at this point to where wearables aren't always going to be like the Samsung Project Muhan device that is this large, you know, gargantuan VR headset. They can be, but they can also be the glasses that we just wear on a daily basis and that are have the ability through that Gemini AI to view the landscape, view our lives the way we do, and then create context and actionable items around that so for example it creates memory this is one one really interesting thing about project astra which are the glasses um approach that we saw at google io earlier this year i got to play around with that is this idea of the fact that like you know at one point i was at a at a kind of a table with a bunch of bottles of liquor and i asked gemini what could i make with this and it you know mm -hmm. gave me a couple of like ideas and i had some follow-ups and then i went on my my kind of demo and then a little bit later i was like Hey, you know, remember back at the the bottles of liquor, there was a book sitting next to that. What was the name of that book? And I hadn't mentioned anything about the book when I was over there. But because it has that multimodality, because it's kind of seeing the life that I'm living while I'm using it, it knew the name of the book and it could tell me all about it. And it has that memory. And once you start to think about that and, you know, how it can instruct you if you're, you know, the, the, the example that Google gave was hanging shelves. But in the demo, it was, um, you know, this like coffee maker. How do I use this coffee maker? Are these the right coffee pods for this coffee maker? Wow. And it knows yeah. how to do all that and instruct you through it. And it just, you know, and then you take that and put it into the glasses paradigm where I think something like that is incredibly useful. And uh, it just opens up a whole field of possibilities. Definitely. Now, your demo included, as you mentioned here, the Project M Muhan, I guess, VR headset uh, from Samsung. Um, yeah. How did this hardware <laughs> showcase the capabilities of Android XR, especially in terms of that visual fidelity and pass-through technology, which, of course, makes it into XR versus AR VR? Yeah, this is this the the whole fidelity aspect of things has been a hill a hill that I've been willing to die on for many years at this point when it comes to VR and I've encountered people that are like no that's not the most important and I'm not saying it's the most important but I am saying it's pretty darn important and when I put on the Project Muhan goggles you know again remember this is a prototype it's not available probably the release version is going to be different i was very struck by a few things by the context in which the pass-through camera was representing the real world in a way that my eyes didn't have to do any gymnastics to make or account for any distance differences between what i expect to see versus what i am i never felt tenuous or unsafe when i was walking through it it really felt like the representation of the world that I was seeing through the pass through was the representation that I would see. You know, it was uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe resed down slightly, but hardly noticeable to my eyes at that moment. And then the fidelity of the virtual objects that interplay with it. There was a, you know, there was a moment where I had a window and I could move it behind a couch. You know, I could, sh I could actually move my hands forward and shift that window and it had an, a spatialized understanding of the room to know that that window is now behind the couch and how that window looks next to the couch, you know, the sharpness, the quality. I saw this AR core bird from a web page and, and said, you know, throw this into the room at real size and it popped it up there. And I was just kind of blown away by the, the level of detail and the sharpness. I really felt like I was looking at a high resolution monitor with my eyes and I didn't see that yeah. screen door effect. I didn't see the spacing of the pixels or anything like that. It just looked sharp. And it, and it was a sharpness that matched pretty closely to the sharpness of the room. And I think that's a really big deal when you're talking about true virtualized uh, experiences. Absolutely. Yeah, that's um, that, that that sharpness is so important um, and I think makes all the difference there. Now, <clears throat> you had features like multimodal controls, eye tracking, which, of course, is important and mm -hmm. circle to search uh, for Android XR's versatility. Which of these features, or maybe there is one that I haven't mentioned, that you do you think sets it apart most from something like the Apple Vision Pro, that very, very expensive headset, or the MetaQuest? I wish that I have had 
have had at this point by this point an experience with apple vision pro because i'm sure that there's mm. some real good kind of analogs to be drawn between what i've witnessed and the apple vision pro so put that on my list if anyone wants to get that for me for christmas that would be great um <laughs> But I mean, the eye tracking was really impressive. I will say that it was a short kind of IPD um, setup process interpupillary distance is a, a new phrase that I learned this week, um, you know, where it, it where it understands the distance between my two eyes. And then I had to do what felt like almost like an optometrist test to kind of follow the dots, keeping my, my face uh, in one place and following the dots with my eyes in order to set up the eye tracking. And then from there, you know, I, I always thought that eye tracking would be kind of inconvenient because it's like not everything that I look at do I want to, you know, place an action on. But the way it worked is if there was an actionable item that I was looking at, it kind of would highlight that item slightly. It might grow a little bit or change a slight color. And then my hands were just resting in my lap. And if I wanted to actually click that, I just, you know, pinched my my uh, pointer to my thumb. I didn't have to like raise my hand to do it. It was just in my lap and I just pinched it and it accepted the click. Um, and again, this goes back to the multimodality of controls, which in this case, what that really tells me is again, AI seems to be really good at bridging the gap from a conversational standpoint of, I don't know the proper syntax, but I know I wanna ask a question and have you do something or look something up. In the case of controls, it's very similar because you can kind of jump between these control mechanisms pretty easily. At one point I could, you know, there was like a, a desk situation, a standing desk with a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse. I could wiggle the mouse and it knows right away, oh, you're in mouse mode now and it switches over. And then the second I hold my hand up, it's right back to hand control and it can bounce between these things. And so it just becomes very versatile from a user perspective. I don't have to think very much about it. It just kind of knows how to follow along with what I want. And I thought that was pretty impressive. That is nice. Um, and it, it also feels to me like a, a really good extension of what what android is like where if you have that familiarity of, of android then there are going to be some things that you kind of can latch onto and go oh mm, right yeah this is you know the, the design language i guess uh, yeah there um now the android xr uh does adapt its ui and its processing workloads based on hardware from vr mm -hmm. headsets to smart glasses which is i think really cool that it can be all those things how does this flexibility impact its potential adoption across those different use cases well i mean i think i think that flexibility is incredibly important you know because i definitely had questions about this if someone if a developer is developing for android xr you know, I saw two very different use cases. I saw the project Wuhan, which is the fully immersive, you know, big goggle, a lot more space to fill with that information. And then I saw the project Astra, which was, um, you know, the glasses with a small display in the center of my eye, which was actually very neat, which we'll talk about. Um, and how, as a developer, do I gracefully scale between these? And the way they put it, which I think makes a heck of a lot of sense is, they've done, Google has done a lot of work making it so that developers who create apps for smartphones don't have to create an entirely new app for the tablet. When they, when they download an app from the Play Store, it knows what device you're using and therefore it can scale appropriately. And in this case, it kind of does the same thing. They were only really showing two different kind of physical use cases of this, the two different uh, formats of, of you know wearable face computers. But there are inevitably going to be others that come along. And based on this kind of flexibility and how they scale it, I think it's going to make it a little bit easier, not, not knowing what a developer actually has to go through, but you know, the way they put it, you know, just a couple of lines of code. I always love that phrase. It's like, really? <laughs> yeah, Is it just really a just a couple lines of, of yeah. lines of code? <laughs> um, but that's what they said, you know, just to, to be able to scale this. And I'm sure there's a little bit of tweaking on how it looks when you're working with this many pixels versus that many pixels, but it should be pretty dy uh, dynamic. Nice. And then uh, Google's use of technologies like Raxium's micro LED displays and split compute configuration, these wild words, uh, seem intriguing. How do these innovations contribute to the overall experience and feasibility of Android XR devices? Well, Raxium's micro LED display is critical, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, critical 
to what we saw with um, Project Astra, that is the wearable glasses with a small display in the front. Um, you know, I saw one with a monocular display and a binocular display, so a single and then a double, one in both eyes. And I mean, they were bright, they were clear, they were sharp. And basically these Raxium micro LEDs are just this tiny, incredibly bright, incredibly high res displays that are embedded into the frame. And then they have this, it's essentially projected into a waveguide down into the lens, into the actual lens receiving area that then reflects it into your eye. And so you end up, you end up going from this tiny, tiny little dot to a full image. And like, I don't know how, like, I'm sure there are other ways to skin that cat, but I was really impressed. This is, this was an uh, acquisition by Google a couple of years ago. And they've been, you know, there's been little news about it, how they were going to use that technology in augmented reality devices going forward. Here you go. When you're talking about split compute configurations, this is really just the sense that that project Astra isn't doing all of this processing in the glasses form factor itself. It's really meant to kind of connect to your phone and share the workload. So if I take a picture with those glasses, it's sending the picture through to my phone and it's immediately putting it onto Google Photos or it's streaming my directions from my phone to my glasses. Um, that's what kind of all that is. And ultimately, you know, what, is, what does it make room for? It just, it just allows for uh, those glasses to be far more capable at that size because they can't get too big otherwise you know people aren't going to want them if they're big and hulking and and fat right. and all that kind of stuff so offload it with the thing you already have in your pocket absolutely well uh we are just about out of time so i guess i'll ask you quickly if there's any last thing that you'd want to say about them in your time with them and then of course give us the rundown on how people can find the work that you're doing yeah, my, my last thing was another thing that really stood out for me, and I know that Apple Vision Pro does this, so I'd love to see how they do it, but Google's uh, spatialization of flat 2D footage was really impressive. And even in Google Photos, you, essentially you're gonna be able to go through all of your Google Photos library and see all of your pictures, all of your videos, fully spatialized, thanks to AI. And I saw examples of it and I was blown away. Like I would not have known that it wasn't created for 3D if, if wow. they hadn't told me. So it was really impressive, cool way to relive your memories and all that kind of stuff. As for the work that I've done, it's been a very busy day. Um, I am now uh, a contributor to Digital Trends. So consider me a, a writer, I guess, at this point also. So you can find my article on this uh, at Digital Trends. You can also find a full video on my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash at Jason Howell, where I dive into the entire experience and uh, basically describe it because I don't have video to show you, but I walk through the entire experience to tell you everything I did. Awesome. Jason Howell, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, break a leg on your show today and uh, <laughs> congratulations on this uh, exclusive. Very cool. Very, very cool. Thank you. Always so much fun to rejoin you guys again. Thank you, Micah. Good to see you. Bye, everybody. Good to see you too. Bye-bye.